and virtual uh, town meeting. <clears throat> For those virtually, board members and some town staff should be visible on your video. I'd also like to remind the board members remotely two things. Please mute your microphones when you're not speaking and do not use the WebEx chat function. This virtual meeting will have public comments. The regular public comment period will be limited to three minutes. The ordinance public comments will also be available. If you're having any problems with connecting remotely, please contact Drew Anderson through our website. We appreciate your patience with this, pers uh, this virtual and in-person format, and we hope to provide a friendly and respectful atmosphere for public dialogue. I call to order this regular meeting of the Monument Board of Trustees, Monday, April 5th, 2021. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Hogan, will you take roll, please? Mayor Wilson. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott. Here. Trustee Clark. Here. Here. Trustee Lakind. Here. Trustee Romanello. Here. Trustee Stevens. Here. Trustee Unruh. Trustee Unruh. Um, Trustee Anru is connected. Uh, she may have some audio difficulties, perhaps, but we show her in the meeting. Okay. Will you note? Will you note both that she is here, Can you but hear audio. Me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm good now. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Before us, we have a consent agenda. Um, is there any modifications to the agenda? I would like to make one modification. I would like to move item 6B to a consent item. It would be consent item 2, 2C. Is there any other uh, modifications? If there are none, we will look for a motion to Approve as modified. I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda as modified. Second. We have a motion a second. Ms. Hogan, would you take roll, please? Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Unruh? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee Lakind? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Motion passes 7-0. Next item on the agenda, oath of office. Uh, Chief Hemingway. Good evening, Mayor Wilson, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Elliott, trustees, and uh, Monument Town staff. Uh, it's extremely uh, happy evening for us tonight as we promote, I'm sorry, appoint three new police officers. At this time, could I ask three new officers to come forward? As a chief of police, very few responsibilities are as important to me as, as appointing new police officers who are professional and ethical to serve this great community. It's now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce officers Nyman, officer Yanez, and officer Dukes to both the town administration and the community. Officer Nyman to my left joins the Monument Police Department following a 21 year career in healthcare. He's earned a bachelor's degree in occupational therapy with a psychology minor from Dominican University of San Rafael in 2000. 
He also completed the Pikes Peak Regional Law Enforcement Academy in 2020. Uh, after having served the opportunity to work with law enforcement on an at-risk adult case that affected a patient where he worked, he was inspired to change his careers in order to serve this community in a different way. Uh, Paul is the son of an Air Force officer. Paul had the opportunity to live all over the United States and Europe, but has always identified Colorado as his home. Paul's married to a nurse for over 22 years when he's not working. So we also thank uh, your, uh, your wife, Randy, for her service. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you might find him uh, standing on the side of a soccer field watching his older son as his son competes or uh, participating in 3D archery range with his younger son, uh, or standing in a river fishing is one of his hobbies. So it's a great pleasure and welcome to the uh, police department. And we'll call their families up momentarily. Officer Yanez, you wanna switch for one second? Okay. Sam Yanez is a 25 year old, um, is 25 years old and is originally from Illinois. Sam has been in the military for seven years six and a half in the Marine Corps and just re recently joined the Colorado National Guard uh, serving with the Army. Sam has been in law enforcement for just over one year. He's worked in Palmer Lake Police Department, Green Mountain Falls Marshal's Office. Uh, Sam graduated also from the Pikes Peak Regional Law Enforcement Academy in December of 2019 and is certified and he is certified as a, a certified handgun instructor. Uh, Sam enjoys spending time outdoors and skiing. We'll have to do some skiing together, bud. Um, so, Sam, welcome to the police department also. Chase Dukes, our local boy. Yeah, reminds me a lot of me when I was his age. Football, dirt bikes, and just a good kid. Well, I probably wasn't that good of a kid, but he's a great kid. A great young man, I should say. Chase is a graduate of Palmer Ridge High School. Go Bears. <laughs> if, if Officer Hudson would just go stand in the back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a native of Bodybit area and an avid Broncos fan. I don't think anybody hates the Broncos except that team in uh, Texas, right? Um, um, uh, da Dallas, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess I'm standing with Officer Hudson in the back. <laughs> After graduating high school, Chase obtained a bachelor's degree in sociology with a concentration in criminal justice and a minor in legal studies from Colorado State University in Fort Collins. You're gonna need that legal study to survive now. But we'll, 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 we have your back, especially in this board. Yes, uh, um, I'm sorry. After graduating, he attended the Pikes Peak Regional Law Enforcement Academy as well, where he completed all the necessary training in December of 2020. Uh, Chase then chose to return home to serve his community that he grew up in. And let me tell you, from interviewing him, he could have picked probably any police department with his skills, with his uh, upbringing, with his uh, degree, uh, but there was nothing more important than coming home and serving this community. And that's the one thing that makes Monument great is that these police officers serve this community because they love this community. And it's because the community shows that same level of respect to this force. So we certainly appreciate it. Uh, while going to school, Chase earned a, uh, a, I'm sorry, worked with his father in the electrician business. Um, and for the town of Estes Park as a parking ambassador. Uh, in May of 20, uh, I'm sorry, in Chase's spare time, he enjoys riding dirt bikes, camping, and finding new places to hike. And we're hoping to get him uh, very active with our Explorer posts so he can show them, uh, you know, what a, what a good childhood could turn into. Um, so at this time, we're gonna administer the oaths of office, um, but as, as the families are coming up, um, I'm gonna start with, with Officer Nyman, uh, with him tonight are his wife, Randy, his son, Chase, and his son, Trent. If you please come forward. With Chase tonight, I'm sorry, with, uh, with Officer Yanez tonight is uh, Detective uh, Yanez also with the Colorado Springs Police Department. Uh, Marcus, would you please come forward? Uh, his mom, Lauren, which is his dad. I'm sorry, Marcus is the dad. Brother Ethan. Uh, sister Audrey, Sister Olivia, Sister Evelyn, girlfriend Kaya. So, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do his in his own room. It looks like. Um, and then we got Duke's uh, dad. So I don't want to miss any Ronnies. We got a few Ronnies here. We got Dad Ronnie, uh, Mom Diane, brother Ronnie, grandfather Ronnie, 
and grandmother Janet, Janice, 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 I'm sorry. And then the other grandparents, Frank and Carol. So if uh, you guys want to just uh, stand, uh, you want to stand off to the side a little bit? Yeah. So I'm going to give you something before you leave to make your swearing in really easy. So we can read right off this over there. You want to, um, you want to stand with your family off to the side there? It's yours. Sam? Paul? That's yours. That way it'll make it easier to, to go along. Okay, you're going to raise your right hand, officers? Okay, you're going to, after I say I state your name, you're actually going to state your name, not state your name. I state your name. Do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution and laws of the United States of America and the state of Colorado and to the ordinances of the town of Monument and that I would defend and protect the lives, safety and property of the people of Monument and that I will faithfully, impartially, and impartially discharge the duties. <clears throat> I'm sorry, discharge the duties <clears throat> of office of peace officer according to the best of my abilities. <clears throat> so help me God. This time, Commander Hudson will present each officer with their badge. Please hand it to the family member who you intend to pin it on you. Go ahead. Everybody got pictures? <clears throat> and what we'll do is we'll step out so the board can continue with the meeting. We'll take some more pictures. At this time, it is with great confidence that I present Officer Dukes, Officer Nyman, and Officer Yanez to the Monument Police Department, <clears throat> the town's administration, our mayor, board of trustees, and this community as they now take on their role as police officers for this community. Congratulations. Make sure you guys show up and read the real board. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, <laughs> well, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, we welcome our new officers and look forward to working with them. At this time, we'll move on with our board meeting. 
Next item is presentation I-25 South Gap update. Uh, Mr. Quick. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name's uh, Larry Quirk. I work for the Colorado Department of Transportation. And uh, we have a short presentation here for you. So you should see on your screen. Uh, that's a snapshot of I-25. Um, Today is April 5th. I am the CDOT project engineer up on the South Gap project from Castle Rock to Monument. Uh, next slide, please. So the original project was broken up into three segments. Some, some of you might see the uh, familiarity with all of this. Uh, the northern section we started first in September of 2018, and that section was actually completed November of last year. Uh, substantially completed. We're not fully completed there yet, but the roadway portion is is done. We're waiting on the all three packages to wrap up together at the same time to uh, implement the final managed lane there. So that that's about six mile stretch of highway was substantially complete last year. The southernmost section down in your neck of the woods, the green section down there from Gre Greenland uh, to Monument uh, started uh, in, in 2019, uh, summer of 2019. And uh, we're we're nearing completion on that one. We've we've done a lot of work down there. Um, we've we've built uh, several wildlife crossings, replaced some bridges down in that area, and uh, we started another section down there. So the county line road bridge is actually a fourth package, but it's within the package two area. So uh, we were allotted some additional funds for the replacement of that structure, and work started on that structure um, about the late January and we are already setting girders in phase one next week. So we are rapidly um, attacking that bridge hardcore. Uh, we want to get that thing done by the end of the year. So that thing is going to, you're going to see a lot of activity around that um, area coming up. Uh, the middle section from about Greenland to Skyview, it was the last segment uh, that went to construction of the original three packages. And that one was last for several reasons. It was the most complex geometrically. Uh, it had the most structures, the most drainage crossing. So it was it was really the the, the hardest uh, section to build, construct, design everything right in that area right there. Uh, a lot of bridge work. So between uh, Spruce Mountain Road and Upper Lake Gulch Road, uh, there are four bridges either under construction. Um, or being rehabbed. So there's three that are being rebuilt and then the railroad bridge is being um, rehabbed right there. So within about a half mile stretch there, there's a ton of bridge work going on right there. So but we're getting there, we're getting package three is more than halfway done, about probably about halfway done, roughly in package three, more than halfway down in package two. Package one is substantially complete. So we're, we're the oh, project as a whole, we're more than halfway there. We're on the downhill side now. So we're nearing, you know, like I said, the county line road bridge. Um, hitting it hard. We're going to set girders next week. So that's that's pretty fast movement on a bridge replacement. So uh, next slide, please. This is uh, some before and after shots of Greenland. So those of you that have driven this area might recognize the old Greenland structure on the upper left there. It was small and narrow and even snow plows and buses had trouble getting through it. So we replaced that and the lower left is the new bridge and then uh, an aerial shot lower right. Uh, and then just north um, towards the upper right of that lower picture, there's a wildlife crossing right there. So just north of Greenland, you can kind of see it in the that, that shot right there. One of our wildlife crossings is right there and that those two structures are done. So those two structures are most mostly done. There's some finishing touches on them, but they're mostly complete. Um, next slide, please. So project promises and progress. So we are replacing five bridges on through the corridor. Um, the latest one, the county line I just mentioned, Spruce Mountain Road is is complete. Upper Lake Gulch Road is about half done. Uh, the bridge over Plum Creek about two thirds. Greenland is done. Um, and then the, the county line uh, really just started a couple months ago, but we are really uh, contract is really going to town out there. There's a lot of stuff flying around there at county line. So we're making good progress there. Uh, paving 822,000 tons of asphalt are going to go down on this project. That is a lot of asphalt a lot. We're more than halfway built out on that. We're going to have a very, very busy paving season. We anticipate probably in the neighborhood of 300,000 tons 
of asphalt to go down this summer. Um, advanced technology, we put a 90,000 linear feet of, of fiber, uh, you know, for high tech. Uh, the future is coming, you know, automated cars, all kinds of stuff. We're not, we're not doing any of that right now, but it will allow for the future expansion and the future as technology um, changes. We're, we're, we have um, additional conduits, uh, for example, in the corridor if they needed to add things in the future, stuff like that. So um, we've really thought ahead about this and, and, you know, allowing for future expansion on all kinds of things like that. So even the bridges that we're building will also allow for future expansion. So things and, and drainage crossings. So to make sure that we don't have to, you know, um, throw anything away, you know, in the future. So we're allowing for that future capacity improvement. So wildlife safety, we are, um, building four wildlife crossings through the corridor and rehabilitating a fifth one. So there's really going to be five wildlife crossings, one down at 162 by monument by the um, RV park there, one at about 164. So it's about a mile north of county line, and then one about a, a half a mile north of Greenland, and then one right by the old um, rest areas, by the rest stops there. And then uh, Plum Creek structure is... Uh, kind of uh, a fifth one that was already existing, but we're making, we're replacing that structure. So we get to take credit for a fifth wildlife crossing there. So um, 19 miles of 20 of the 28 miles of deer fence have been installed. That's a lot of deer fence. That's eight foot tall deer fence to keep wildlife off of the highways. And it really is designed where it channel is. It, it, we attempt to, to direct um, wildlife movements towards the wildlife crossings. So we have these wildlife fences kind of directing their traffic movements to the wildlife crossings, if you will. And then we have also a bunch of uh, deer guards. So they're like cattle guards, and I'm sure everyone knows what a cattle guard is. They're similar in in, in nature, but they're a little bit more robust. They're uh, a little bit different pattern where the, the animals don't like to walk on this grate, so it keeps them out of that area. So we're installing, I believe it's 28 uh, wildlife crossings also. And those are just getting started. Those are just getting started. We're going to do some down on Monument Hill. There's also someone on County Line, Greenland, all the way through the quarter. We have a bunch of wildlife um, wildlife uh, crossings, cr crossing guards. So um, next, next slide, please. Uh, the project, we're on time. We're on budget. We, we're... Um, targeting November of next year to be fully complete and done and gone and out of the way. Um, and that's, you know, we, we will be in a very, very good position by the end of this year, even to be honest with you. Um, we have a good shot, a good chance of being substantially complete as far as um, the pavement alignment. So traffic should be in its final traffic patterns and those kinds of things by by the end of this year. But there'll still be a lot of work to do next year. There's still top mat of asphalt, another layer of, of asphalt, final striping, final signing, toll testing, the managed lane. So there's still a lot in seating and, and, and landscaping, stuff like that. So there's still a lot of work to do, um, but we're trying to, to target uh, a possible um, um, final alignment uh, completion by the end of this year anyway. And that goes hand in hand with that 300,000 tons of asphalt that I signed earlier. We got to get that 300,000 tons this year to make that um, a possibility. Uh, you see in the picture there, that's county line. That's the county line bridge structure. Um, we wanted to include that bridge structure in the original packages, but um, the funding wasn't there. And so we did secure some additional funding for that. Um, and so we added that into the project. It was designed and delivered and we commenced work in January and we'll have that one done by the end of the year for sure. Uh, probably possibly even sooner, possibly maybe like uh, Halloween or something. We'll be we'll be done with that thing. But we're setting girders in the in the first phase of a of a multi phase bridge structure, or which you'll see here in a minute too. We also added um, southbound I twenty five truck climbing lane between Gle Greenland and the way station, which was a that was a huge huge win for the project quarter. We also wanted to include that originally, but again didn't have the funds to do so. So we got some freight money. So freight funding came forward because there's a lot of it's a heavy truck corridor. And so we got some money that allowed us to add a truck climbing lane, which is a big deal down there. It goes all the way up and over the hill to the rest area. I'm sorry, to the um to the way station. And without replacing the and that also kind of spurred on the county line bridge replacement. Because, you know, to really take full advantage of that climbing lane, you really needed to also replace that bridge 
So they kind of went hand in hand right there together. And then we also have a truck, uh, a brand new, we're going to build a brand new truck chain up station at um, the old southbound rest area there by Larkspur, uh, which is a big deal too. To, you know, in the winter time, we all know it snows. It snows pretty darn good down there in that neck of the woods, I gotta tell you. Um, and then, uh, boy, I'll tell you, we, we found a lot of unsuitable soil material, which was, which was really disappointing and it kind of hurt us a little bit uh, budget wise, but we found money for it. We're fixing it. We're doing the right thing. And the right thing is to build this road um, in a very robust condition where it has a long lifespan and that's what we're doing. So we spent a lot of time and effort and energy and study and, and all this stuff designing, um, um, replacing unsuitable materials because we don't want to have roadway failures down the road. So we, we've really focused a lot of attention on that and it's, it costs us quite a bit of money. But, you know, again, we're doing the right thing and, and, and you know, to, to CDOT's credit higher up, they, they found us the money. They, they also committed to doing the right thing and found us the money. And so our current budget has grown. We originally started this with about a $350 million budget. We're up to about 419 now with all of these improvements that I've just listed right here, adding up to the, you know, the 419 total. Um, next slide, please. Okay, county line uh, road. So this is uh, again county line. We're looking. Uh, this is looking east. So we're kind of on that southwest side. You can kind of see the old girders there. This bridge is really old and tired. It's really due for replacement. We're very happy that we got the money to do this. It, it's not just good for the project. It also it was also needed. You know, this bridge is is on was on the re bridge replacement list, which is how we got additional funding to be able to replace it in the first place. So contractors are really going to town. There's a lot of earthwork. Uh, we've already drilled a bunch of caissons, port abutments and piers and setting girders stuff. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the county line bridge, so this will be the final alignment. So this shows you, if, if anyone's familiar with that uh, older bridge, it was a two lane structure, you know, which served it served well back, you know, when it was originally built, it, it fulfilled a need, but it's kind of outgrown uh, let me rephrase that the demographics in the area have kind of outgrown the size uh, nature of that bridge structure. So the new bridge will have dedicated left turn lanes and through lanes, wide shoulders. Um, it'll really be a nice looking wide open bridge structure, which is very much needed down in that area. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here's the phasing. So I was mentioning phasing. So phase one is building the outside um, areas, uh, in the, the, and th that's where we're going to be setting girders next week, Monday and Tuesday night. We're setting girders, uh, 1 direction, I believe northbound is 1st and then southbound the next night. So we're setting girders uh, by direction. And then after that, you know, they can start pouring bridge decks and bridge rail and all, all the other stuff that goes along with bridge work. And then phase 2 is building, you know, and then, and then we switch traffic and then we put traffic on the outside on the new structure. And then we have to go in the middle and then build the middle section and then tie it all together. And then uh, we can add, you know, do the final alignment there. And then space three is, is kind of tricky too, because we have to then tie in the roadway to the bridge. And so there's a lot of asphalt work, a lot of leveling, you know, for, for smooth transition type stuff. We can't have, you know, hard bumps or anything like that. So uh, we, we really, you know, there, there's a lot of work going on in that area is what I'm trying to say. And, um, there's going to be some, there's going to be some, uh, so, some impacts to traffic a little bit, a little bit, but we try to focus and prioritize on emergency responders. We have a very good relationship with the emergency responders in the area, um, fire, police, uh, state patrol, and, uh, we have a meeting every 2 weeks. Um, if anyone's interested in, uh, you know, joining that meeting, um, I encourage you to do so. I'd be glad to give you information on it, but we meet with emergency responders every 2 weeks and we update them on all this stuff. And. There's been a lot of good things that have come out of those meetings, um, but this is also the type of information that we want to share with them. Hey, we, we have this stuff coming up. You know, what can we do to work together to make sure that emergency services are as um, impacted as little as possible? So, um, next slide, please. Caroline, uh, the bridge, the traffic impact. So, here's some of the impacts. So. There will be a six week closure of the northbound on and off ramps. So northbound side only. We could not move those ramps. We have to reconstruct those ramps in the same alignment they're in. And so be it to be able to do that, we have to close, we have to close them to do that. 
they couldn't move them for lots of reasons. There's uh, right of way issues. There was um, wetlands issues. There was grade issues. There's all kinds of issues there. It was just not feasible to actually move those ramps. Otherwise, we probably would have moved those ramps, but we couldn't. The southbound side, not as impact, not as much. The southbound side, we were able to move the ramps. So that's a good thing. So we don't have to do the same thing on the southbound side of these. There will be a four day closure coming up of the county line bridge itself to tie in there. That was for the phase three stuff that I was telling you about, where they tie everything together. There's just no other way to do it. We have to safely, we have to close that ramp, but we're going to have detours in place. There will be detours, it will be signed. Um, they'll either send them down to 105 and back up or up to Greenland and back down to one or the other. Um, there will be periodic closures of county line itself up top. Um, for various things like setting girders, like I could just mentioned and stuff like that. We can't, we can't work, do work like that over live traffic. It's just, it's, we just can't do it. It's not safe. So we have to have some closure. Sometimes we use the ramps where we send traffic off the off ramp and back on the highway again. So sometimes we do things like that. And then intermittent traffic shifts, uh, temporary alignments. There'll be a lot of when we have to shift between phases, for example, we have to. Um, remove the old striping and put in new striping and shift traffic around. So you'll see some traffic pattern changes down there. There'll be a lot of flaggers down there. Um, there'll be a lot of trucks going in and out, concrete, dirt, asphalt, you name it. There's girders. There's all kinds of things. Cranes. You're going to see big cranes down there. Um, there's going to be some minor delays, and there's probably going to be some one-way traffic, one-way, uh, well, they're letting one direction through at a time with flagging operations. So you'll see some of that from time to time, depending on the workload and what's what needs to get done. And then for more information, you can always access this website right here. Um, and you can also come to that two week meeting uh, that I mentioned about. And I would be glad to come uh, join you guys again on future future town meetings if you need additional updates, that kind of stuff. So uh, next slide, please. So here is a, we have a digital open house. So. You know, time, the, the last year has been kind of rough on all of us, right? With COVID time. So instead of doing like traditional open houses, we came up, our, our PR team actually came up with some ideas uh, creatively to, to try to continue to deliver information and do public outreach and answer questions and let people have their voices heard and stuff like that. And this is one of the things they have a digital open house. And you're welcome to, if you can copy that link right there or take a picture of it, if you just type that in um, a search. Browser. It's going to take you to this um, open house. There's a lot of information in there, project info, fact sheets, email updates, stuff you can sign up for, stuff like that too. So um, next slide, please. Uh, CDOT safety efforts. We have put a tremendous amount of time and effort and money and energy into making sure that this project runs as safely as humanly possible. We, we're doing all kinds of things. Uh, that I've never even done before on, on previous projects. So we, uh, uh, for example, some of the things we're doing, reducing the speed limits and, and those are automated. We have um, some variable uh, speed limit signs, some PBSLs, portable variable speed limit signs that we can move around and we can program them remotely from this. Uh, this picture is our project operations center. That's at our field office. So we can access cameras through the corridor. We can, if we, uh, if we see an accident or snow or whatever, we can change speed limits. We can reach out to um, the Golden um, Traffic Operations Center, to the State Patrol, to CDOT Maintenance. So we can do a lot of coordination, really coordination from that room and communication. A lot, a lot of stuff going on there. And then uh, we have some other safety features, some really cool um, smart work zone um, technology that we call it. Q warning, uh, Q detection and scene warning system. So we're trying to warn traffic uh, approaching truck scenery and exiting the highway, for example, into the work zone, uh, Q detection. So if the traffic starts to back up, we have some automated um, detectors that sense this and we'll send messages back on message boards to try to, hey, or traffic ahead, stuff like that, um, portable message boards. Uh, Project Operations Center that I just mentioned, there's a picture of it right there. Uh, courtesy Control, we have two of our own tow trucks. You've probably seen them going there. If you drive that quarter, you've probably seen them. Those are some busy guys right there. Those are two of the hardest working guys in the whole corridor right there. I'll tell you what, those guys work 12 hour days. Uh, they're doing everything from helping people uh, that run out of gas or flat tires or accidents and everything in between. You, you can't, you'd be surprised And they're, they're towing trucks to designated drop points and they're helping for free of charge, free of charge. That's where we're, we focus on quick clearance. The faster that we can clear the accident or the incident or whatever ha it happens to be, the faster we can get that cleared off the highway. 
the same for everything is, okay? Uh, frequent restriping, delineation, we're always chasing potholes, especially this time of year. Springtime is really hard with us for potholes. They just grow sometimes, you know, out of nowhere, <laughs> seemingly anyway. Um, barrier repair, sometimes there's accidents, they hit our barrier, we gotta go fix stuff all the time. Uh, we are, through the project, we are actually paying the state patrol for additional patrols. So the state patrol performs patrols through there already anyway, and we're paying for additional patrols because we know that this is such a challenging corridor. It's narrow, it's tight, it's congested. Um, and we have 80, in the summer, we have 80,000 cars a day travel this corridor. That is a lot of traffic. The state patrol, they even do um, ground ground uh, to air um, speed uh, patrols. So, and, and it, State Patrol has been a very, very good partner for us working down there. We, we've worked very close with them. They, they've done a lot with us. And we've done a lot with them. So uh, those are the, the next one is the biweekly meetings. I was mentioning earlier with first responders where we discuss and share information and come up with ideas. And uh, it's been a really great uh, rewarding meeting for all of us. Uh, provide accurate and timely information to motorists. So we're, we have um, uh, emails and Facebook and text alerts. We have all kinds of things coming up on the future slide that you can sign up for if you're not already signed up where you can get alerts through the corridor. Uh, the winter operations. So we strategize when we had this big storm uh, about what? Three weeks ago, I think it was. We had the big storm down there and before we knew it was coming. So we sat, we, we met and we strategized and the contractor came to the table with some equipment and we closed the highway. We helped the state patrol and CDOT maintenance close the highway. The highway was closed in our quarter for 20 hours. It was closed from 11, uh, 11 a.m. Um, until the next morning at about uh, 7 a.m. Uh, the next day. Uh, but, you know, that, that was part of those efforts of, of working together. So the state patrol, we all knew about it. Well, we'll talk about it together. The state patrol is responsible also for recording accident history and stuff like that. And they are reporting about a 15% reduction in crashes over the last year or so. And probably part of that's related to COVID because we did see a decline in traffic volumes, but we also saw an increase in traffic speeds. So I don't think all of that was related to uh, COVID, but we've also like the Northern section, for example, is wide open. And we've actually increased the speed limit up there to a final condition. Northbound is at 75 already up that northern five mile, the package one that I was talking about earlier. So um, next slide, please. And it, we're almost done. I think we're almost done, but uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, so here's our text subscribers, Facebook, eblast, news releases, hotline. Our, our PR team, they, they do a tremendous job of outreaching and answering questions and helping people find information on stuff. We won a project award last year for uh, Women in Transportation Society uh, for an innovative transportation solution. We have over 40 um, females working on our project. We're proud of anything, everything from managers, uh, engineers, supervisors, um, technicians, and we want to award an innovative uh, solution award for that through that. And we're very proud of all the, the ladies that work with us on there. Um, outreach presentation, we, my, between myself and my boss, Paul Neiman, he's the project director. I'm the project engineer. We do meetings and presentations like this all the time. This is nothing new for us. So hopefully uh, I'm doing an okay job for you guys today. But we do a lot of this uh, trying to just share information. We just we don't want full transparency. We wanted people to know where we're at, what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it, how much it costs. We have nothing to hide. We don't want to hide anything. We don't want anything that, you know, th think that. So we try to do this to, to do this outreach. Senator Bennett uh, paid us a visit January 11th. I believe it was uh, Paul met with him down there. And it was a small crowd because of COVID times, but uh, I don't know. He wanted to come see the progress on 1 of the more significant projects um, happening in the state. So he came down. So um, next slide, please. I think we're about done. We're getting there. Uh, yeah. So I think this is it. So. Uh, there's me at top and uh, Emily uh, works with us and she's a PR expert and she is a fabulous to work with. There's our hotline number. There's a website. There's uh, you can register for text alerts. You can you can follow us on Facebook and you can sign up for email too. So with that, that's about um, all I wanted to say to you guys. Do you guys have any questions or anything that I can help you with today? Any questions for me? Do we have any questions from the board? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Cork. 
and we will move forward. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Uh, item 4B, Home Rule, Mr. Ricci. Good evening. So I've been asked to give a short public facing presentation about the town's recent efforts with um, researching the pros and cons of moving to home rule. I'm going to see if we have ability to switch this and we do. All right, so I just want to kind of, I've done this in a kind of question and answer format and I wanted to uh, just first go over the basics. So the town board has been researching the pros and cons of switching monument for the local form of government from a statutory town to a home rule town. Uh, here in Colorado, communities can be either. The default is as a statutory town. Um, but as many municipalities grow, they tend to opt for home rule. So this process takes about a year and requires a significant amount of resident involvement. And of course, voter approval of the final. And final approval of the um, charter. Can you hear me okay online? Okay. So home rule is a type of government that gives greater control to local citizens uh, rather than the state government. So, and this is enshrined in the Colorado Constitution. It is something that uh, the Constitution believes is appropriate to give people a the most control over their local government, which is the best government, because they have the most control and the most say. So going on, what does it mean for Monument? Currently as a statutory town, the state legislature sets the rules for how the town operates, um, what they have the authority to do. If, and I deal with this all the time as an attorney, if there's no specific state statute, that covers a particular point, the town can't address the problem. Um, that's just how it, it's a, I almost call it a mother may I system, but it is a system by which you have to look for a specific state granted authority. Moving to a home rule form of government creates better efficiencies for the town and allows the town to legislate and address whatever issue that is of local concern to the town. So how would it work for Monument? So each home rule community operates under a charter. And that's really what we're talking about doing here with moving to home rule is creating a charter. It's written by local citizens elected to a charter committee, and then it's approved by the voters. Um, and home rule municipalities have the power to make laws relevant to what I was talking about of local concern, minimal state intervention. So if there's case law or Colorado statute or the constitution says this is a matter of local concern, local municipalities can do it um, without any state interference in it. The state may not like uh, what you've chosen to do, but you can do it if you are a home rule municipality. Now, federal and state laws still apply, um, those that are not of local concern, but, um, but, but the town would actually have a great deal more control over its day-to-day -day operations. Um, So issues that, uh, I probably did, I probably broke it because the slides are not advancing. Hold on, be on point in just a second. Potential issues. All right. So. One of the potential issues that we run into is that it's a very calendar driven process requiring two elections and then drafting and proposal deadlines to be met. Uh, the charges are created by a commission of residents that can't be amended after they are created. They just have to be voted up or down. So that's a, that's a major uh, issue where it's like, you have to get this correct when you do it. Um, and then once adopted, a charter can only be changed through a new election of the voters. You know, your town, your board of trustees cannot amend the charter. Um, and then I will say that charter changes could create additional work and new processes for town to staff to address. And um, one thing that is interesting 
that we've heard from multiple sources is that uh, maybe the only thing worse than having a the limits of statutory towns, the, the state looking over your shoulder is having a poor uh, charter that you work with instead. So it's it's important to get some of these issues correct. All right. So next question is, who has adopted it? Um, this is not cutting edge from our perspective. 92% of all Colorado residents that live in a municipality live in a home rule municipality. Um, neighboring municipalities that have adopted home rule include most of those around us in Castle Rock, Castle Pines, Larkspur, Manitou, and Fountain. Um, you will find only a handful of towns larger than Monument who are still statutory towns and many that are much smaller. I looked up Larkspur, I think has 250 residents and it is home rule. So it, it is, there's no limit as to the size, but as you grow, it is much more likely, for instance, Colorado Springs and Pueblo have been home rule for quite a while. So the main areas of change, what are they gonna be? The biggest areas of change uh, are going to be in community development and overall financial well-being well -being for the town. Um, the state, again, we operate on just what the state tells us to do and how the state tells us to do it. Uh, there's more flexibility in land use and zoning if you're a home rule municipality and more um, control over finances, both for how we operate financially and um, what sort of revenue is available to the town. And if the voters approve it, all sorts of different uh, revenue sources could be addressed to kind of meet the needs of the town and how the town operates. So I think I think the question that most voters would be asking, so how does this affect me? Um, changing to home rule will probably not change the average person's daily life. If you think about it, you probably don't notice a great deal of difference in the daily life of someone who lives in Colorado Springs, a home or a municipality and monument. Um, what I will say though, is it does have more of a long-term quality of life uh, impact here for the town. If the town has better planning and zoning abilities, um, that's likely to improve long-term quality of life here. Also, uh, greater involvement with folks with the local municipality and how it operates. Um, it, the, it will also, I would say, the only real near-term change will be the need for a large amount of community involvement through the charter making process and vote. Um, that's going to be important for folks to be involved. All right, next question. So how do we get involved? Um, I, I encourage folks to sign up for our newsletter. Um, can talk to our uh, folks about running for the Charter Commission. I know uh, our town clerk, Laura Hogan, has lots of information. And we'd also encourage you to do some research on your own if, you, if you're interested. Uh, the Colorado Municipal League has kind of the presentation on um, home rule, and I put the, the link to that right there in the website. So if anyone is interested, we're happy to answer questions um, if you have any. Thank you. Yes, questions from the board. What's the next step? So the next step will be um, starting down the road of, I think, additional community outreach and setting for moving, starting to move forward towards the Charter Commission election. So you have to declare an election. People have to run for the Charter Commission and that vote would be held if moved, if we do that this summer, uh, this fall. So those are those are kind of the next steps down the road. Okay, so one of my questions was, what does the board do? This is a citizen driven or a community driven effort. What role does the board play with this? When you say declare an election, is that the board's doing? That is the board's doing. So the I would say the board initiates the process and in some cases uh, sets initial dates for meetings and that type of thing. But after there's an election, the actions of the commission drawing up the charter will be pretty autonomous. Okay. Can anybody, can just anybody 
on the board ask to uh, then declare the next step to move forward? Can we do it today? Well, what will need to happen is we will need to do uh, some resolutions and ordinances. So there, like I said, this is a very calendar driven process of which Laura is the complete and utter expert in this area. Um, and so what we'll have to be doing is some resolutions and ordinances to take the steps required through this process if the board decides to go down that route. So I, I think to, to clarify that if you declare for an election on the wrong date, you would end up having a special election when you only want to piggyback on a regular election. That is correct. The goal would be to have, in our case, two November elections, this November and next November. This November for the folks who write the charter and then next November for the vote on the charter itself. But once you declare you are required to have a election within a certain time period, correct? That is correct. Since the average citizen hasn't, uh, unless they came from Castle Pines or something like that, they haven't had experience doing the charter. How does that process, uh, uh, not going into a lot of detail, but just overall, how, how does that process work? Do they just get a blank piece of paper and say, here it is, let's uh, do a charter? Or is there any kind of uh, state guidelines or how does that process work? Fair enough. I think the reality is the town has the option and I think would be encouraged to provide town staff like the town attorney and others um, to, to assist in drafting up a charter. I will also say that certain organizations like CML have created large amounts of information um, with regard to how to draft one of these. They have a lovely book that I've I've gotten my hands on that has everybody's charter provisions on 13 different points. And so the major issues they've already outlined who has what and where, and then it's at that point, you're simply looking up and figuring out what it is you would like to do and what best fits the town's needs. What is the mechanism <clears throat> going to be used to get the citizens involved? Social media probably is one. Has the town thought about direct mailers to every single address in the town? Usage rates to get to know commercials on TV, radio station spots. We have to get them to know. You can see by the turnout. There is not a lot of citizens here. We are considering all those. Actually, um, we are doing, I think we just signed on with a company to do three surveys. Uh, one is a general survey for the community. The second one is going to be over home rule. And so we will do a survey for the um, entire citizenry. And it will be more of an educational survey to kind of educate them, but also ask them questions that uh, they might consider running for the commission or something like that, you know, things like that. And I know that several. Uh, people in the room now are looking for people to be on the charter commission. What is the mechanism of having a diverse charter commission versus a charter commission made of five people that live on the same street and are all best friends? So that is something that the board of trustees can do. Uh, it would be one of the steps if you if the board directs us to move forward. Um, there is a portion by which you could set up uh, districts and or wards within the town and have a requirement that somebody come from each ward or so many are elected at large. Um, there's a lot of options there if the te if the board wants to pursue them. Does that carry over to the home rule or does or once you do that, then does the charter commission get the opportunity to do something long term for that? The Charter Commission would get the opportunity to do something long term, so but not necessarily carry over. Whatever the board set in place as Charter Commission boundaries, it would only stand for that particular portion. That is correct. Okay. Do you have an example of a resolution that we would be able to review and vote on? Uh, maybe at the next meeting that gets the ball rolling, or can we just go ahead and do a marketing campaign? And how does this work? So, if you're, if you would, if the board would like to do that, we could certainly move forward fairly quickly on doing a resolution to get this started. And I think, I think many of the other efforts should probably run concurrent 
with the efforts by the board to get things scheduled and started. We have a timeline already set up for all of these issues that we're considering this year. You'll see one that's coming up now. Um, so we could definitely get that out to you. Get it prepared for the resolution is going to be pretty simple to get it drafted. Okay. Do we have any questions from our online members? Okay. I think it, I think this is a pretty um, important step to take, and I'm on board with doing whatever I can to help facilitate it. Sounds good. Um, I think we have consist consensus. Correct me if I'm wrong. Of the town staff moving forward as necessary. Mm -hmm. I think I think we've made it clear we don't want to get ahead of ourselves and cause ourselves other problems, but. No. We'll consider that also having a timeline. And it might be beneficial to make that. Timeline and possibly the slideshow available to the public. On our website, or some sort of link, we can definitely do that. And again, we have a board uh, retreat in June, and this will be 1 of the topics that we finalize at that board meeting, but we'll start on that prior to this. Okay. There are no other questions. We will move forward. Moving on to item, uh, item number 5A, ordinance number 13, 2021. Uh, ordinance submitting to the voters, the town of Monument. Uh, wow, there is no short title for this. Town of Monument ballot initiative or issue. Uh, Mr. Ricci. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so the Taxpayer Bill of Rights uh, Article 10, Section 20 of the Colorado Constitution limits the Town of Monuments revenue and its use in a couple of different ways. Uh, firstly, it requires voter approval of all changes in tax rates, um, which, of course, in compliance with Tabor, the town voters have voted, have approved all tax rates for the Town of Monument. The second way Tabor limits revenue is what's known as its ratcheting provision. So it allows revenue to rise only so much based upon a statewide statutory formula based upon inflation and local growth. Um, while the Tabor requirement for local approval of tax rates it cannot be altered locally, local voters can vote to retain control over locally approved revenue by voting to not apply the statutory ratcheting formula calculating permissible revenue. Uh, this allows the town to collect and retain the revenue generated by voter approved taxes in the method and at the rate approved by the voters. Uh, taxes are not raised uh, when this is done. Um, what it does is it just allows the town to keep what it collects. Um, the voter approved exemption from the statutory formula, formula is uh, kind of colloquially known as debrucing, uh, named after Mr. Bruce, who uh, created Tabor. Um, so, the option to exempt local revenues from the statutory formula has been very popular with voters over the years, both statewide and locally. Most Colorado residents live in a municipality or county that has voted to exempt local revenues from the statutory formula in whole or in part. Um, this is according to the Colorado Municipal League and Bell Policy Center. Monument voters specifically have voted to exempt the town from statutory formula six times since 1996. Uh, and have never failed to approve the exemption on an existing source of revenue in 25 years. Uh, town voters have also approved the exemption on all new revenues. So Monument has previously asked for the exemption of local revenues from the state formula in four year increments, which was, I will tell you, initially thought to be required by the statute, but has, due to case law, not a requirement anymore. Um, each time, the town is asked, the voters have approved. The suggested ballot issue before you is based on the historic support already described um, and would make the town exemption from that state formula permanent starting 2020 and going forward. If approved by the voters, revenues collected above the formula limits will be used for town parks and road improvements. So as far as a fiscal impact, an approval of the ballot issue will not raise taxes. 
as it's not possible to predict um, future revenues and limits under the formula, an amount of revenue retained is not possible to determine. I, mean, my, I tell people my crystal ball is broken. Um, however, by not continuing to ask the voters in four year ex for every four years for an exemption um, from the statutory formula, the town will save the cost of continuing to place measures on the ballot every four years. Uh, the recommendation from staff is to is the passage of ordinance 1321 an ordinance submitting to the voters of the town of monument colorado a ballot issue permitting the town to collect retain and spend the full amount of town revenues for the year 2020 and all years thereafter and setting the ballot title and ballot issue thank you okay. this is a public hearing item so um do we have anyone from the public that would like to speak for or against this item Mr. Anderson, do we have anyone online? Okay. Uh, go ahead and connect her. Ms. Swearingen, did you have a comment on ordinance number 13-2021? Well, actually, I raised my hand back at the home rule one. So, um, <laughs> can I go back to that? We will, we will circle back to you in public comments. Okay. Um, well, if, in regards to this one, um, I think that uh, if you want to um, get this out there and and people to accept it that there's going to need to be quite a bit more public discussion and quite a bit more information given out to everyone uh, to describe the reasons why you are you are making this move. Um, Gallagher was repealed at the last election uh, because people were afraid to go for a full Tabor repeal. So I think it's important that if you're if you're looking at going after Tabor, um, that uh, you present some really good solid facts in regards to that about the benefits to everybody and the positive aspects of, of what you're trying to present. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, was there anybody else? Okay. At this time, I'll leave the public hearing portion open but bring it back to the board for further discussion and questions. Questions from the board. Uh, I understand where you're coming from that every time in the past when we've done these types of things, uh, approval from the citizens, they've always approved it. However, the fundamental concept behind Tabor is that money when you, uh, if for whatever reason over the period, the four year period of time, you uh, have budgeted $9 million and $10 million actually comes in, then you have an extra, you have an excess of revenue of $1 million here, uh, for example. And the bottom line there is, uh, according to Tabor, that money does not belong to the government, even though they've collected it, that money belongs to the people. And uh, without a vote like this, that money should be returned to the people. Uh, in the past, what I've seen is that they've said, without raising taxes, as you said, uh, we uh, want to the 1 million and whatever dollars that we have uh, uh, received in excess of our budget would like to be spent on, you know, expanding Jackson Creek Road and whatever, you know, use list them out and say, here's what we need to do. Uh, and I've seen those kinds of ballot measures pass very readily. However, these general unending uh, ballot measures that just say, well, give us all your money and whatever you give us, we're going to keep and uh, at perpetuity. I've never seen those. I think I've seen uh, the school board try a couple of those things where they and they've gone down in flames. Uh, so if there's any type of increase that's uh, set in perpetuity, uh, I haven't seen it be successful at all. So, I personally will say, from my experience, I don't think this will, as it's currently written, uh, it's too vague, it's too general, it's too wide open, and I don't think it's going to be accepted by the citizens of Monument. Are, are you referring to to be used for town parks and road improvements? 
Well, I, I, I'm talking about being more specific to that. See, the ballot yeah. measures, even back on the tax issues, the ballot measures and tax issues that have passed have been ones that said, here's what we're going to do, here's how much money we need, here's what we're going to do with it, and here's when the spending is done and it's over with and there's an end to it. Uh, in the case of these kinds of things, uh, when I've seen them pass, uh, they said uh, we've uh, collected in excess. Of, we've collected 1.5 million dollars, or whatever the amount is, in excess, uh, and uh, we have a desperate need to, rip, you know, this. Uh, here's the projects that we plan to do, and here's the cost associated with those projects, and this is what we will do in the next two years or a year or whatever. You put a timeline on it. You put a budget on it. You say this is where the money's going. I know it's extra work, uh, and this is very nice and makes life easier for staff, but I haven't, uh, but wide open things, I've not seen them work very well. I would question, um, so we went a long time without having any excess revenues, and what would your suggestion to be, would, what would your suggestion be to plan for that? So we say, we're going to spend this much on parks and we go five years without any excess revenues. No, well, see what's happened is you've already collect. My understanding is this is money that we've already collected. So in the year 2020, uh, we went over our, our revenue collections mm -hmm. have exceeded our revenue expenses. So that extra money there is now to be refunded according to Tabor is to be refunded to the people, or we can say, well, we worked really hard on the budget and we only anticipated $9 million coming in, uh, but more than we expected, who knew uh, that it would happen, but more than expected, but we deliberated very hard and we're really in desperate need to have more police officers on the street. And we you know, would like to spend the $1.2 million, whatever the dollar amount is that we've collected in excess of our last year's budget or last two years budget. I think there's a tolerance. It's not down to the penny. So you don't have to, you know, okay, we we got an extra $10 last year. So we'd like to put that on the ballot, but there's a certain range where you, you know, above a certain amount where you can do that. Uh, so I think when you say, here's the dollar amount and here's where we're gonna hire two new officers uh, and, or, and the police equipment to go with them or whatever the specific thing is and delineate those things out. Okay, Mr. Ricci, can you expand on that? How do you forecast that for a four year term or? Right, so what happens is you have a calculating base year under Tabor. You have a calculating base year upon which the ratcheting of, and, it, and it's, not, it's not what's budgeted, it's an index to population growth or decline and inflation. And so, couple of factors that the town doesn't actually have any control over um, will tell us whether or not we have excess revenue or not. What the town is asking to do is with the with this particular issue is to be able to keep the revenues that the taxpayers have already approved. And so the issue becomes we don't know from year to year what this next year is going to have as far as an increase or decrease that what it, what ends up happening here is that it that whenever you get good years you cannot take advantage of them and then they go down and the number resets if you have an economic downturn for, per se and then you, when it goes back up you're still you're still limited as you climb to get back up to where the town was so what it does is it keeps the town from collecting more money based upon like i said inflation and town population so it's it's a very it's a very strange way to hold down revenues of the town in in my opinion because what it does is it indexes not to local growth per se so if you have 800 uh, new residents and you collect a lot of taxes that may or may not fully reflect in the amount you're the extra amount you're allowed to collect under Tabor and is it known how many times in the past we've exceeded our what we've collected? I don't believe it's been very many times. I don't think very many, but we can find that yeah. answer to that question out and get I can send that to you. I would like to <clears throat> say um, that I agree with uh, Trustee <coughs> Stevens on his um, 
assumptions and the point he's made. And uh, a poll of my constituents, 89% have say, stated they do not want this resolution passed. I mean, excuse me, this ordinance passed. And it's my uh, uh, understanding from them that any overage of taxes collected, they would prefer to receive back as it is their money. Thank you. Okay. When was the last time this resolution was on the ballot and passed? It was last on the ballot. Twenty fifteen. So six years ago. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it come up sooner? So every so many years it's been set up that we have to approve it every five or six years. Because it's what happens is we the previous ballot initiatives have exempted that ratchet exempted the town revenues from that ratcheting effect for a four year period and then you recalculate the base year using the the year that the current that the current ballot initiative expires and so last year we did not do one with covid and everything else going on and so this year we are seeking to debruce moving forward in the same way just without the four year time horizon so we don't need so we don't even know if this uh ballot initiative it allows us to keep overages if we ever have any that's correct so you wouldn't be returning money to anybody because we haven't gone over well if if we don't approve this we could have to go back to i think the last time we did it was 2015 laura we would have had to do it in 20 19 is that correct so 2019 would have had to do it and then um right now because we didn't do it in 2019 we missed that we would have to return all the revenues that were overage for 2020 and 2021 uh, at the end of so the we year. were over for 2020 I'd, I'd have to verify that i said i meant if we were over we, were. we would have to return those overages I, I want to add that I agree that, well, I don't have a problem with us going back to the voters to vote on keeping the revenues that they've previously voted. This all years thereafter shudders me to the language that was used for the police tax, where it kept, you kept adding statements um, or uh, and I can't remember what the exact verbiage was, but it was basically we can spend this on whatever we want, despite the fact that we pointed out in particular what we were going to spend it on. There was always this clause at the end of every statement to say the money could be spent on anything else. So I think we need to get away from any ballot language that has this in perpetuity of just going on forever. So would it be your suggestion to continue limiting it to four years? If that's what the, the people have spoken and said yes to a dozen times previously, I think there should be a start date and an end date. And then if they need to go, if we need to go back and ask them for it again, we can. Any other questions or comments? So if we wanted to amend the ordinance, they could amend it here? They could. Um, I would have to figure out the language very quickly. <clears throat> I would like to um, also say that uh, I agree with Trustee Lakind. Uh, the makeup of the people that are moving into Monument, in the la especially in the last four or five years, is incredibly different than the current population that was, or the population that was currently in place several years ago. And I think that um, we need to take some kind of pulse of the community with ideas maybe in our newsletter that we we, we uh, print, um, asking people or at least introducing the idea of it to two people before we move forward on anything. And Mayor, I apologize for this, but we're not in any rush on this. I don't think there's no deadline for us to get this on there. This was just one that you had ready to present to the board. And so if you want us to, we could take another two weeks and take a look at this and take your advice on that and come back to you in two weeks. Okay. 
I think that's a good idea. Um, thank you, Trustee Romanello. Thank you, Trustee Clark, for your comments. Uh, Mr. Anderson, do we have anybody new on comments? Okay, at this point, I'm going to close the public comment here uh, portion of this hearing and have the board uh, either provide direction or a motion. Um, any suggestion? I don't think the wording change is going to be that challenging, you know, at the towards the end of the ordinance. But since I'm hearing that most people would like you to come back in two weeks with the revised ordinance. So, if I may ask real quickly, um, what your time frame? I was typing in changes right now. <laughs> what, what, what uh, direction would the board want to go with for a time frame? For this next round, four or five, is there a particular number? I think it would be really important to give the community at least 60 days of heads up with a newsletter or something on the website that starts talking about it and explaining it so they have a uh, better comprehension of the actual process and what it would mean to their bottom line. I'm not sure that we're afforded 60 days on this to declare something for the ballot. Uh, Ms. Hogan? Well, if you, it would need to be referred via ordinance and that ordinance would need to be effective prior to ballot certification time frame, which is early September. Oh, okay. It's longer than I thought. Yeah, I would just recommend taking the, the excess money that we, and having uh, Ms. Ooms calculate whatever the, you know, the amount is or, you know, if it's calc if it's based off of uh, a, a statutory rule or whatever, then maybe you're you would be more appropriate to do that. But determine what the excess amount is, and then you could even take language from two fifteen, and then we could look at our supplemental budget of things that we needed last time uh, when we were doing our budget, and saying those are things that we desperately needed, but yet we're unable to afford because of our current projections. Uh, and then say, okay, here's what we we need more officers, or we need those supplemental items, uh, and pick those up uh, with that. And one thing I'd like to remind the board, and I think Ms. Ohms would like us to remember, is that we're well below the 15% reserve right now. Uh, we are trying to get our reserves up to at least 15%. Uh, personally, I'd like it to be somewhere near 25%. And so this helps us get get to that goal. Not only, like you said, um, Trustee Stevens, you know, meet some of our supplementary requests, but we also want to continue to work on increasing our reserves. So, how does can you tell us well, how uh, Tabor handles reserves and things like that? I know there's a mandatory reserve. There's a mandatory reserve. Um, <laughs> Tabor really is as as I read it, does not take into account beyond that very minimal reserve, which we have, right. um, any any other factors other than ratcheting based upon those factors. It's it's a it's a tying taxes to growth formula, and so it doesn't take into account the financial health of the town. It doesn't take into account any other factors. Just what what's the baseline based upon the the couple of numbers. And then where's it gone since then? So you pick a base year baseline year, which in this case would be 2020, and then you recalculate every year thereafter. Okay, I would think that if this is important for things like our reserve red rev revenues, you would at least know how many times we've gone over in the past when you came to present this. I find that well pretty so, disappointing. So I think the reality here is. Each and every year since 1996, the town has been debruced other than 2020 and this year. So every year the town has not had to give it back. They Every four years, they get an exemption and the law states the next time it expires is the next year that you would recalculate the base level for where you ratchet up from there. The reality is every four years since 1996, 
the town has passed a debrucing measure. So we've, the town has never been required, as far as I can tell, to give money back because the revenues have always been debruced. So, so that to my point is, if the town is approving it every year or every four years, why change the language now to say we're not going to ask you permission again? Obviously, there was a formula that worked, and the town staff decided to go against the known formula that works and take advantage of the, the citizens by not asking them again for permission. So no, I don't think that, with that. I don't think that ever crossed anybody's well, mind. Well, I mean, you take advantage of the 15, 20 years of the town saying yes. So now you're just going to take advantage of their good nature and say we're not asking you again. No, that's that wasn't that wasn't the point at all. Uh, the point was to look at. Do we have to take this every four years and spend money on elections? Because every four years we might not have to have an election, but this would create an election opportunity for us to spend fifteen up to fifteen thousand dollars in that year to take this to the voters. We wanted to find out, give them the opportunity. If they want to do it four years, then fine. If they want to do it for the rest of the time, a lot of you research this. How many towns? have done this forever. Like um, 43 counties, and I haven't been able to figure out how many towns, but it's a lot. Most, most people live, most Coloradoans, if not all, live in some form of debruced county or city if they live in a municipality. And I will say that all of everything that's been approved since Tabor that I've been able to find in our records has previously been debruced. So we're really only talking about our mill rate, and maybe some quite old sales taxes that were approved prior to Tabor. So it's not been to Bruce. Okay. So, Mr. Foreman, please explain that again. You said that we let this lag because when we when you were talking about the intention, what was the intention? The intention was to present it to the voters because we went back and looked at every election and it has it has been passed every time. So Thinking about cost of elections, we figured let's present it to them one last time. And if they approve it this time forever, then we never have to bring it back to them again because every time it's been taken to the voters, they've approved it. And I will, if I can jump and in so, about that four year formula, the reality is, from my research, the four year formula came from an initial reading of how Tabor was set up that people believed they had to get it approved every four years. In the mid 2000s, there was a state court case which indicated, no, in fact, you did not have to come back at, uh, in a cycle and keep asking. You could at, ask in perpetuity. Again, it's been 25 or ish years. And so we thought, you know, why don't need to be on the cycle if we don't have to. Why would you ask this year or any other year if you don't even know if you've ever gone over Tabor? The reason why we wanted to do it this year is we looked back at history and said they've passed it every time. How many times have we gone over the table? I can't answer. We've that. never had to, cal we've never had to calculate. We've never calculated. That's the, so. That's the issue. So you feel it's necessary to have the voters approve something that might not even exist or happen. We're required to have the voters approve this. We're required by the state to have the voters approve this if we want to debruce. If we don't debruce. We might have to give them some of their taxes back, and that that's up to the board. The staff has no position on this. We're just following state law, and so when you say we did or whatever, we don't have a position on this. We we're going to do what you want to do, and so, so whatever the board wants to do, we're going to put into this document, and you can pass it. That's all we want to do. I'm not asking as you directly or the staff directly. I'm right. asking. Why would somebody take this to the voters if they're not even sure it's ever happened? We're required to. Well, this is this is something Re required to ask for excess revenues that you don't have. We don't know that. I I can't tell you right now that we don't have that. I've I've answered that now three times. I can't tell you that we don't have that. If we, I can find that out tomorrow. We can do. I can get staff working on that tomorrow, and I'll get you a, but, an answer by the end of the so week. So my question is are you still required to take it to the voters if you have no if no. the town has never gone over no there's no reason for us to take it to the voters but if we do go over and we haven't taken it to the voters we will have to pay them back 
when we can't put it towards our reserve and we can't put it towards uh, okay, so it's preemptive of going over it's for the next four years yep. okay. what about the last four years so you don't know what our status financially is i will find that out by friday we can we, we can look into that but again i don't believe the town has ever had to follow the calculation because with that four-year cycle the town voters have always simply reset the clock like hitting the snooze button and it runs for four more years and when you do that the base year moves out and then you don't have to do the calculation for four years and then if it passes again you don't have to do the calculation for four years and that's so that's exactly why we've never done the calculation is we've always been debruced yeah that's that's really truly why we don't know because we've never had to calculate it. But if we're supposed to do it every four years, and the last time we did it in 2015, that doesn't add up. We missed 2019. That's why I so said we didn't early. calculate 2020 or our 2019. New, our new base year would be 2020. Yep. As I understand it. Okay. And the only time it's ever the only time it ever becomes an issue is if the citizens ask for it. We could never debruce, and if the citizens never asked for it, nothing would ever happen. But if the citizens asked for it, then we would have to pay it back. And you could have it applied to something else, and if we had to pay it back, we might have to make changes in our budget. Usually when it's paid back, it's applied to something else, correct? There's a number of different ways to pay it back. You can yeah. adjust tax rates going forward. You can mail everybody a check. There's a couple of different options. Yep. All right. I'm going to motion that we postpone this item for 30 days. I second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Hogan, will you take roll? Trustee Unruh? Yes. Trustee Lakind? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. That motion passes 7 0. This item will be postponed for 30 days. Next item on the agenda item 5B, ordinance number 14 2021. Uh, Rezoning and preliminary preliminary plan development site for elite crane shop office and storage. Ms. Flynn. My mic on, sorry. Good evening, Mayor and Trustees. Tonight is ordinance 14, 2021, Elite Crane Shop Office and Storage Yard. It's rezoned and plan development for a preliminary final site plan. The site is off of Cynthia's Avenue across a mile high overstock. The exact location is 940 Cincy's Avenue. The development would access directly off of Cincy's Avenue. It's two acres in size. The north of the site is a vacant lot. South is Electric Propulsion Lab. East is Denver and, and Rio Grande Western Railroad. And west is a mile high overstock LLC. This is a rezone from PID, Planned Industrial Development, to plan development, and the purpose of the zone change is not a choice to the applicant, but a requirement of the town's municipal code, section 17.40.050. The proposed site will include a fenced outdoor storage yard, required parking and landscaping. The chain link fence is proposed for security reasons. Mature, mature trees will be relocated um, to screen the shop to the east and outside of the fence. Currently, there's trees on the property that they want to keep and move to screen the property. And there'll be one wall light on the exterior of the proposed shop and office and one light pole in the center of the yard, which will be dark sky compliant. Water, sewer, electricity, and gas are all adjacent to Cynthia's Avenue. And this is the proposed site. And the comprehensive plans future land use map shows this as light industrial. Then a little bit about elite cranes. 
They're locally owned and operated custom crane rental business. They have been serving the Pikes Peak region for over 25 years, providing hydraulic truck cranes, all-terrain cranes, rough terrain cranes, crawler cranes, ranging from 30 to 300 tons for their clients. And they currently rent in Palmer Lake and they would like to open their own business in Monument. And here are some examples of the cranes that they rent out. They're open 10 days a week, five days a week, 10 hours a day, five days a week, sorry. Um, <laughs> that would be a lot of work for their employees. <laughs> uh, it would be 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Five employees will arrive on site and that's five total trips. And then 6.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. there will be four cranes and trucks leaving the site. That would be four trips. Then from 2 to 5 p.m. they'll be turned from the site and that's another four trips. And then 2.30 to 5.30, five employees will depart from the site that's inside the building. So 18 trips a day. There'll be four to six employees return around 2 to 5 p.m. every day. And clients and customers generally don't visit the shop or the yard as Elite Crane is not a retail business. And here's some of their shop and elevation renderings. They're going to be similar to, if you, don't, if you remember, Redline Pipeline and ABC Landscaping, the metal building. They're going to have a similar building to that one. This is the list who have commented on the project. And on March 10th, 2021, one resident had questions for the applicant regarding how often the cranes will be raised for maintenance, screening of the yard adjacent to the railroad tracks. Like I said, the trees will be screening of the railroad tracks so you can, the residents on the other side won't see the cranes and the cranes are not lifted that often for maintenance only it's at needed basis and to uh, offload items as well and the cranes are not too loud as um as well that was another question and the resident had was about the noise level and the location of the trucks within the yard and planning commission voted six to zero to recommend approval the Planning Commission recommends approval of Ordinance 14 2021 Elite Crane Shop Office Storage Rezone and Preliminary Final PD Site Plan based on the findings that the proposed development complies with all standards and criteria for approval. And Stacy and Sam Laurie, who own Elite Cranes, are here today um, for them to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Stacy Lowry. And I'm Sam Lowry. Thank you. Um, the applicant doesn't have a presentation this evening. Okay. This is a public hearing item, so I'll open up open it up to the public for any comments on this item. Uh, Mr. Anderson, do we have any comments for this item? online okay and seeing none in the audience i will leave the online public hearing or the online attendees open for public comment while the board discusses does the board have questions for mr or miss lowry or for debbie at this point I have a, a question. Go ahead. Would the applicant consider an eight foot fence versus a six foot fence? Um, on, do you know? Oh. oh, go ahead. The requirement was six foot fence. Um, it was there a chain link fence for six feet. Um, the fencing will be in the back where the trees will be lined and then in the front for security reasons. So we don't want to look like a yard. We want to look more inviting on Office Cynthia's Avenue, and that's why we had a six foot fence. There's no um, dirt 
or debris barrier, it will go through a chain link fence. It'll go through the chain link fence. The, they'll have a driveway and then they, they will have an area on the yard to park their vehicles and inside their warehouse. Thank you. Can, can I? Do you need to press or? No, it's on already. Uh, Ma'am, the uh, so the front on Cynthia's Avenue, that'll be a privacy fence. So that fence will be an actual, uh, it'll be a wooden cedar type fence um, to kind of dress that side up. The, the sides of the yard, the north and south side of the yard, We'll also have privacy slats in the chain link fence to hinder the view uh, inside. The fence on the east side facing the railroad tracks, well, we've actually, uh, with the recommendation of Debbie, we moved that fence inside the property line 10 feet. So the trees that we plant will be, the, you'll be able to see the trees before you see the fence, if that makes sense, from the east side certainly appreciate that clarification. Thank you so much. And if I'm understanding the map correctly, there's not only <clears throat> to your east, there's the railroad tracks, and then it looks like there's a quite an easement between you and the next residential area, which I would assume is, uh, which area is that? Are you talking lab? On no, the other side. To the east. To the east. Road track. The other side of the railroad tracks. Oh yes. There's that's the Is that past yeah. past times area? Be a hundred uh that's probably a hundred feet at least, hundred, hundred and fifty feet from the mm -hmm. back of our property, across the tracks over to the east properties and their fence line. I'm I'm guessing, but that's I'm pretty sure it's it's over a hundred feet. I, I would guess so too. To your north is just another lot, correct? Correct. And then north, everything north of that is part of Cynthia's Industrial Park, correct? Yeah, everything north of, of us is part of the same eight, yeah. eight lot. Um, it's called Villiani. Villiani Industrial Park is what yep. it's called. And okay. they're they're vacant lots currently. Oh, okay. Uh, other questions, concerns from the board? Mr. Anderson, do we have anybody online wishing to comment? Okay, at this time, I will close the public hearing portion of this item and bring it back to the board for a motion or a modification. I'd like to make a motion to approve ordinance number 14, 2021, an ordinance approving a rezone and preliminary final plan development site plan for Elite Crane's shop office storage. Second. We have a motion and a second, Ms. Hogan. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Trustee Lakind? Yes. Trustee Unruh? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. That motion passes 7 0. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Lowry. Thank you. This takes us to. Item number 5D, no, 5C, uh, ordinance number 15, 2021, an ordinance approving final plat for Monument Industrial Park. Ms. Flynn. Again, this is 15, 2021, final plat for Monument Industrial Park. Monument Industrial Park is situated west of I-25, east of Old Denver Road, and north of Baptist Road. It's a permitted use within Regency Park PID and PCD zones. The total, oops, sorry. The total platted area is 13.394 acres in size. Lot 1 is 9.616 acres in size, which is, includes a warehousing distribution center. Lot two is 1.379 acres in size, and it's the detention pond. There are two right-of-ways, Terrazzo Drive, which is 1.379 acres, and La Campanana Drive, which is 1.020 acres in size. The plot is consistent with the proposed Monument Industrial Park final site plan, 
and all codes or standards are met for this project. On March 10th, um, 2021 at the planning commission hearing, no one from the public spoke for or against this project and planning commissioners voted seven to zero and recommended of approval. Planning Commission recommends approval of Ordinance 15 2021, a final plat for Monument Industrial Park, based on the findings that the proposed development complies with all standards and criteria for approval. And tonight, Andrea Barlow is here with NES representing her client, Curtis Gibson. And uh, I, oh, sorry. Uh, and I first like to introduce Curtis Gibson, who's with Clark Investment Group, and they are the developers of the property. Just wants to say a few words about the company. Curtis, yeah. go ahead. Yes. Good evening, uh, Curtis Gibson, Clark Investment Group. We represent two family offices here in Wichita, Kansas. Two development offices. We develop across the country in uh, very, very uh, Class A institutional product. And we are holders that typically develop and hold long term um, in our portfolio. So I appreciate uh, appreciate the opportunity this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Just briefly, as uh, Debbie indicated, the site is just to the north of the Valero gas station on Baptist Road. It is the area that was kind of remaining outside of the Santa Fe Park development that was recently approved. So this is the remaining parcel. The property does straddle the PID zone and PCD zone for Regency Park. Um, most of it is in the PID, really. It's just the southern tip, which is where the detention pond is located. That will be in the PCD zone. Uh, Regency Park is treated as a straight zoning in, in the town. So with that, um, we, as long as we are within the zoning criteria and um, parameters within the zone, then that site plan is approved administratively. So it is only the final plat that um, comes to the Planning Commission and the board. So these are the various um, criteria and our proposed site plan will meet all of these. It's currently in review and the use itself of office and warehousing is um, within the uh, approved uses in the zone in both zones uh, the height of the building is planned at around plus or minus 40 feet and the lot coverage is going to be about 28 percent and we meet all the setbacks uh, per the zoning so just uh, talk about the plat and uh, debbie did a good job of describing that it's a couple of lots uh the main lot the larger areas for the buildings themselves and the smaller parcel is for uh, the detention pond with the access roads included also. I just wanted to show you the site plan. This is turned around. So north is on the left side of the plan to the top of the, plan, uh, the site plan. There is uh, I-25. So including landscaping uh, around the perimeter and the loading area for the building is on the internal side. So off Terrazzo Drive in order to present a better front to the highway. So you get a better visual impression from the highway. And then I just have a couple of renderings that were prepared for, uh, for by the architects. So this is kind of um, from the south driving north on I-25 and then from the opposite direction. There is some attention to detail on the architecture to provide some interest and articulation and uh, also some fenestration there to break up the um, overall appearance of the building. And with that, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions you may have. This is a public hearing item, so I will open it up to the public for any comment. Do we have anybody that would like to comment for or against this item? Mr. Anderson, do we have anybody online that would like to comment on this item? Okay, I will leave the online comments open for this public hearing for the time being. Uh, 
questions from the board members from for either Ms. Flynn or Ms. Barlow. Okay. Mr. Anderson, has anybody raised their hand? At this point, I will close the public I, public hearing portion of this item and bring it back to the board for a motion. I make a motion to approve ordinance 15-2021, an ordinance approving a final plat for Monument Industrial Park. Yep. Uh, Trustee Clark, was that your second? Yes, that was my second. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hogan, will you take roll, please? Trustee Unruh? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Trustee Romanello? I'll come back to him. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee Lekind? Yes. Mayor Pro or, pardon me, Trustee Romanello. Mr. Anderson, are you showing him online still? Okay. We will leave leave that as an <clears throat> abstain. So that motion passes six zero one. All right. Uh, that takes us to ordinance number sixteen twenty twenty one. Uh, an ordinance approving preliminary plan development site for village at Jackson Creek. Before we start this, Mr. Foreman, do you have some comments about this particular item? Yes, I do. Uh, we received a letter today from the um, planning commission about some of the things that were in our uh, staff memo. And uh, I addressed that with each one of the board members, each one of the planning commission members. Um, I think we probably included some language in there that probably shouldn't have been in there. Uh, I noticed it after I got that letter and uh, I apologize to each one of them. Uh, I, the, the language that was in there was not appropriate and uh, I made a promise to them, make a promise to this board that that won't happen again. Um, and also I'd like to announce um, that at this time, we made a change in leadership in the planning commission uh, on the planning for the planning director. Uh, Larry Manning is no longer with the town of Monument. Ms. Flynn, uh, was there any questions in regards to that particular piece before we get on with the uh, ordinance? Okay, Ms. Flynn, uh, will you go ahead? Oh, did we have an online comment? Yes, I, I'm sorry. I missed the last part of Mr. Foreman's speech there. Could he repeat, please? The part about Larry Manning is no longer with the town of Monument. Uh, no, the prior, the, the comments prior to that. Uh, you want to start Go over? ahead and start. Yeah, I'll start please. over. Um, so anyway, we received a letter today from two of our plan or one of our planning commissioners that copied another one. And uh, they had brought to my attention that we had made some statements in, in this presentation and staff memo uh, that probably weren't what the town of monument wants to put out. Uh, it's not what I directed to be put out, and it's definitely not what I would approve. I don't think this board would approve it, and I don't think it's fair for to the planning commission. Uh, so that um, we address that, I called each and every one of them today and apologized to them, and uh, told them, promised them that it would not happen, and I promised this board that it, that will not happen again. I think we have a great staff uh, here that's working very hard. Uh, they were just misdirected in this case, and uh, I support them 100%, and they know uh, what to do and what to put in board memos, and uh, we have a system set up, and we have uh, assistance for them. 
uh, going forward in the future. Uh, one thing that I did tell the planning commission today is that uh, me and Mr. Ricci will be at each one of those meetings going forward until we hire a, hire a new planning director. Was the um, was this process off the typical grid of what's normally associated with the planning commission, or is this a uh, a one time event, or has this been ongoing? Ms. I think I think it was. A, go ahead, Mayor. I'm sorry, Trustee Clark. I was just going to clarify um, in the staff memo on this particular item the it's depicted as the planning department disagrees with the planning commission that is not their role and i think the planning department understands it's not their role to dis disagree with the planning commission but to convey to us the planning commission's um recommendations and if we inquire the planning department on what their thoughts are, there's nothing wrong with that, but it should not be in our, uh, it's kind of degrading to the planning commission in a, in the sense that uh, just states that the planning department does not agree with our commission. And, and as far as I know, Ms. Clark, this is yes, a one-time event. So the, this is, I think this is the first time us that have been on the board for a while have ever seen this kind of uh, comment in a uh, board packet. So they in the board comment packet or in the board comments, it was it was stated that the one department did not agree with the other department. Is that correct? Am I hearing that right? No. One department, a town staff did not agree with the planning commission. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, that clarifies a lot. Okay, thank you for repeating that. I appreciate that that clarification. Okay. Okay, Ms. Flynn, please go ahead. You know to start or not. Sorry. Again, this is Ordinance 16-2021, um, approving a preliminary plan development site plan and rezone for village at Jackson Creek. On February 1st, the Board of Trustees voted to send the Village of Jackson Creek's proposal back to the Planning Commission. The Board had four options to approve, approve with conditions, deny, or ask the applicant to bring the proposal back to the Planning Commission. The Board felt that the applicant needed to present their changes made to the Board, to the Planning Commission, because the changes were based on the Planning Commission's concerns from the January 13th hearing. Town staff approves the changes the applicant has made to Village at Jackson Creek's preliminary, preliminary PD site plan, rezoning the site from Regency Park planned industrial development to a mixed use development and a planned development zone complements the comprehensive plan. The applicant has addressed the Planning Commission's concerns from the January 13th hearing. The Planning Commission recommended approval of Ordinance 16 2021 a preliminary PD site plan and rezone for village at Jackson Creek with the following conditions. The development shall be substantial conformity to the proposed uses site plan submitted to the Board of Trustees on February 1st, 2021 on page 66 of the packet. The, that the setback from Jackson Creek Parkway be 25 feet from the property line and the maximum height at the setback be 30 feet and each additional 10 feet from the setback. The height may increase 10 feet up to the maximum height as heights are proposed in the site plan. The planning department recommends approval of ordinance 16 2021 without the planning commission's conditions. The planning commission's first condition requires the applicant to submit a preliminary PD site plan site plan depicting where each proposed use will be located. The planning will be located. The planning commission's rec recommended number one refers to a rendering included by the applicant in their presentation which was intended for illustrative purposes only, which included details not required, and it was not submitted by the applicant as their preliminary PD site plan. According to chapter 17.40160, preliminary PD site plan and PD zoning regulations of the town's municipal code, the following are sum submitted requirements, a preliminary PD site plan, design guidelines, zoning regulations. The applicant is not required to submit a preliminary PD 
plan depicting where each proposed use will be located. This will be done at the final site plans when they are submitted. The Planning Commission's second condition requires the applicant to change their proposed setbacks to a dis distant, different than similar developments within the town of Monument along Jackson Creek Parkway corridor. The changes proposed by the applicant in the revised submittal, both the reduction of maximum heights and the lowering of multifamily density addresses previous Planning Commission's concerns. Next, Brett Benke from Creekside Developers will now present the changes made to the Village of Jackson Creek's preliminary PD site plan. All right, uh, thank you, Debbie, and um, good evening. I'm Brett Ben Q with Creekside Developers. Um, nice to see you all again. I'll try to keep it um, brief tonight, as I think we've um, gone through this in in detail before. But um, again, our our vision for this uh, for the village at Jackson Creek is to create a mixed use uh, village destination concept that is much more connected and walkable than de developments that currently exist in the town of Monument. Um, there will be enhanced, well-lit and landscaped roadways and streetscapes that are walker and biker friendly. It will provide opportunities to live, work and play all in the same neighborhood. And there will be community gathering spaces with hopefully a library, senior center, class A multifamily, senior housing, restaurants, retailers and employment. So the subject area is shown as mixed use and business campus on the future land use map in the 2017 comprehensive plan. Uh, this vision closely follows the definition of mixed use as stated in the comprehensive plan. And similar to a business campus, the vision includes bringing additional businesses, employers and well paying jobs to the town of Monument. So to address uh, planning commission's prior concerns and whenever I last presented, we had made um, some of these changes and expanded on to them, but um, we have revised uh, the pre preliminary PD site plan to limit multifamily uh, housing density to not exceed 20 units per acre, which uh, matches the maximum allow allowable density in a planned multi-use development uh, PMD zone. And then to also limit overall multifamily residential use by mirroring the definition of mixed use development as defined in the town of monument comprehensive plan, which states multifamily residential use shall be subordinate to non residential uses. And then the current PID zoning allows for maximum building height of 90 feet up to Jackson Creek Parkway. And so to address concerns about building height, we have reduced allowable building height in this area from the existing 90 feet to 75 feet for any buildings in the zone, which are within 600 feet of the I-25 right away. And this is approximately the location of the westerly roundabout that's shown on the site plan. And then beyond that, east of that, from 90 feet to 50 feet for any buildings within the zone, which are more than 600 feet of the I-25 right away. And just for reference, Jackson Creek Parkway is approximately 2,000 feet from I-25. And then so next, I would just like to address uh, the Planning Commission's uh, conditions, just to add on to what Debbie said. So their first com condition uh, relating to the um, proposed uses or the potential uses that were shown on that site plan. Um, again, that was just a, a conceptual plan that stated that there would be a CVS and a library and a grocery and medical office buildings and the locations of them. Well, those were, you know, conceptual, as she said, building lot lines, configurations will likely change and so forth. So as uh, Debbie stated, the preliminary PD site plan for village at Jackson Creek as submitted uh, meets or exceeds the requirements of a preliminary PD site plan. Um, simply a conceptual plan, and it does not contain a list of, a uh, complete list of our permitted uses, which 
um, the preliminary site plan does include that, which mirrors PCD allowable uses with some uh, minor um, uh, changes. So, and then the lot lines and building sizes shown are conceptual. Um, the final plats and final PD site plans will come before the Planning Commission and Board of Trustees for each phase of development going forward. And then the final plats and PDs will show final lot configurations and building sizes. So, and then to address our second condition, so the setback from Jackson Creek Parkway shall be 25 feet from the property line and the maximum building height at the setback shall be 30 feet. And each additional 10 feet from the setback, the height may increase 10 feet up to the maximum height as proposed in the site plan. So Jackson Creek Parkway is classified as a major collector and per the Regency Park Zoning Code, and the building setback from a major collector within the PCD zone is 20 feet. And so that would be similar to Monument Marketplace has a 20 foot setback and then the PCD zone areas to the north along Jackson Creek Parkway will have a 20 feet setback. And so why should this, uh, why should a different standard be imposed on the village at Jackson Creek? And then similar concerns on building height. Um, the existing zoning allows for up to 90 feet from Jack, up to 90 feet at Jackson Creek Parkway. And we've already propo proposed reducing this down to 50 feet. And so Monument Marketplace, Monument Marketplace North, and the PCD to the north each have a 50-foot maximum building height. So in, imposing a different standard on this project could put us at a competitive disadvantage to these, to these other uh, sites. And then please also keep in mind the projects across I-25, such as Falcon Commerce Center, Conexus Phase 2 and 3, and Santa Fe Park each have been approved with 90 feet with 90 to 100 feet maximum building heights. So with that, I will conclude, but I hope you agree that um, this development will be a fun and valuable addition to the community and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, this also is a public hearing item. Um, I will open it up to the public for any who would like to speak for or against this item. Uh, Mr. Anderson, do we have anyone online that would like to speak for or against this item? Okay. Um, seeing no others, I will leave the online open briefly and we will have board discussion. Uh, questions or comments for this item? I have <clears throat> some questions for yeah. both our attorney and planning staff. The planning commission recommendations legal or not legal by definition of our regulations? I can answer. I can answer the requirements. So when the planning commission votes, Speak up, please. I'm sorry, when the planning commission takes their vote, I feel bad because this is like a higher than me, this little spot right here, sorry. Um, when the planning commission votes, it's a recommendation that they're giving to the board of trustees. Planning staff doesn't always have to use their conditions, especially when it's based not on the code or the comprehensive plan. However, if their conditions were based on the comprehensive plan or the land development code, then we would approve those conditions and bring them to you as stated. So the conditions that are listed here, one and two. Yes. Our recommendations. Our recommendations. We approve with conditions. Yeah. But they're not conforming to our, our comprehensive plan or our code. I'm more concerned about the code. Yes. So if, if I think it, it would be correct to state they're more restrictive than what our code allows. Correct. So then technically not legal. Correct. For them. And to there's a precedent set that the other developments correct. that are being approved even by the planning commission are less restrictive than what's in this request. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there a reason why this is more restrictive? Can anyone answer that for me? 
I, I don't think we have clear reasoning from the planning commission of why they felt this particular case needed separate guidelines. So I would say no, I don't think anybody can explain that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Anderson, do we have anyone online? Okay, at this point, I will close the public uh, hearing portion of this ordinance. Um, is there any further discussion from the board? I have a, an issue with, unless I'm reading it wrong, but I have an issue with conditions being set that violate the, the existing regulations. I think, I think that's part of the learning curve, but I also think the planning commission needs to understand they can propose policy changes to us and to town staff, and we can look at that. You can't propose it to an individual builder um, or an individual developer. I, I am curious as to why, even with conditions, the planning commission's approval was only 4-3, but I think discussing that further would be taking us off topic. Yeah, for a later date, it might be worth a workshop. It is on. Okay. okay. All right. So, I was just going to say that it's, uh, uh, might be worth a workshop to, you know, uh, address concerns of the planning commission because I understand what the statute says and I understand what their concerns are. Uh, so I think we need to kind of uh, get find a happy medium here where we can. Uh, but again, that's a, another time, but maybe that's worth addressing as a workshop. Okay, yeah. we have. To let you know, we just had a workshop with the planning commission and our attorney and the attorney that's doing our code rewrite. And so I think some of these issues have been addressed. Uh, this, this might have come right after that meeting, I think. So, so we just had a workshop with them and I think there were some legal issues that were brought up during that. And hopefully they were addressed, but that's also 1 of the things that we want to make sure you understand and you, you know, we're going to do is that. Me and Mr. Ritchie are going to be there and we think we can help this along and help answer some of their questions during the proceedings. Right. Well, my con concern was also with the policy concern. If they right. have, if they are concerned that we're overbuilding or something like that, then I'd like to hear their feedback and see what, because they are in this day to day. But again, another, another topic for another day. <clears throat> Would you like to make a motion while you're there, Trustee Stevens? <laughs> okay, uh, let's see where we're at. Um, 5D. Okay, so I'm, I move ordinance number 162021, ordinance approving a preliminary planning development site, plan and rezone for village at Jackson Creek. Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Hogan, will you take roll, please? Trustee Clark. Well, I would like to say that I think this development is really beautiful. So I'm going to say yes to this. Trustee Lekind? Yes. Trustee Unruh? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes 7 0. Uh, moving forward, ordinance number 17 2021. Uh, uh, approving the purchase of real property, Mr. Ricci. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so the town has been searching for some additional land to put water infrastructure up on the top of Monument Hill to replace the current water tank up there. Um, so approximately one half acre of land located directly east of the town's current water storage tank. Um, 
has been offered to the town for purchase at a cost of $70,000. Uh, the plan used for the land is additional space for a, a new water storage tank and water infrastructure. Um, the current tank is really truly at the end of its lifespan and getting this extra half acre will allow the town to build a new water storage facility on the spot without having to first take down and decommission the current tank. And so there will be no interruption in service. It also allows us to comply with the infrastructure timing requirements of the COP bonds acquired in 2020. Um, on the board memo, there's a, a, an illustrative map. Again, the, the lot lines are very much approximate drawn by yours truly, but I wanted to give you guys an idea of what this looked like um, and where it was. So again, right, you can see on the, on the uh, map there, our water tank in the lower left-hand corner, the green box represents the approximate half acre there of where this is going to be. The new tank um, will go right there where the barn building is um, in the photograph. And you can see I-25 for reference in the corner of Bricker and Beacon Light for, for further reference there. Um, so this ordinance would authorize the purchase of the property as outlined in Exhibit A and the use of 2A water ASD funds to purchase the property. The Town of Monument has the power through Colorado state statutes to purchase real property through ordinance. The Town Board of Trustees through ordinance 08-2009 authorized the 2A water ASD fund and authorized the transfer of 100% of the net of the 1% sales tax and all related revenue and expenditures from the general fund to fund um, and accurately account for the financing development of new water acquisitions of which uh, storage and delivery of which this would be uh, in order to affect uh, in order to affect the purchase of the property. The proposed ordinance specifically directs that 2A water funds be used for the purpose purchase of the property in conformance with ordinance number 08 2009. The fiscal impact here is that the town will pay $70,000 out of the 2A water fund to Mr. Ferguson through interstate 25 properties LTD, the company holding the property in exchange for the property. Uh, presenting a cost per square foot of approximately $3.20, which is in line with recent sales in the area and appraisal of the parcel of land directly north of the town's water tank. Uh, the negotiated purchase price is a significant uh, savings over the appraised cost of procuring nearby land with enough space for a new tank and infrastructure. So we could expand the lot we have or go get a bigger lot somewhere else and it's cheaper to expand the lot we have. Um, so staff recommends approval of ordinance 17 2021 an ordinance of the town of monument colorado approving the purchase of real property located adjacent to the town's water tank on beacon line road and providing other details regarding the financing of the purchase no it is not this is a public hearing item, so I will open it up to public comments. Uh, Mr. Anderson, do we have anybody online for public comment? Do we have anybody in the gallery that would like to comment? <laughs> um, I will leave the public hearing portion open temporarily and bring it back to the board for further discussion. Comments from the board. This makes I'll make a motion. Me. Okay. <laughs> Is there anybody the else that has their hand up? Uh, Trustee Romanello, give me a moment to close the public hearing portion. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Elliott, go ahead with your comment. I was just saying this makes total sense. No interruption in water and very low cost for the purchase of the land. Thank you. At this point, I will close the public hearing portion of this item and bring it back to Trustee Romanello for a motion. I move to pass ordinance number 17-2021, an ordinance of the Town of Monument, Colorado, approving the purchase of real property located adjacent to the town's water tank, located on Beacon Light Road, El Paso County, Colorado, and providing other details regarding the financing of the purchase. Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Hogan, would you take roll, please? Trustee Romanello? Yes. Trustee Unruh? 
Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee LaKind? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Trustee Clark? No. That motion passes 6 1. That takes us to resolution 6 A, resolution number 23 2021, uh, Town of Monument, uh, revision to Town of Monument fee schedule. Ms. Flynn. Good evening again. Um, the planning department is requesting approval to update the planning department's permitting fee schedule. These fees have not been updated for over 10 years. To provide better service, the planning department is consolidating fees. There is no fee increase. The town staff is also requesting the removal of the town hall room rental section from the town of monuments fee schedule. The planning department also wishes to remove the residential landscaping permit. The town's engineering assistant does not inspect residential landscapings for backyards. However, new residential subdivisions will be required to submit their landscaping plans to be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Also, homeowners will still need to follow the town of Monuments landscape design guidelines as stated in chapter 1752-040 landscaping standards of the town's municipal code. And I have an example in the packet for you. One was a final site inspection fee. This fee was to provide the CO for residential and commercial new builds. Currently, there are two, three, four, five line items for this one fee. The town which is to consolidate it to two line items um, from zero to 25 acres and over 25 acres fee. And we had the home builders. Home Housing and Building Association reviewer fees as well, and they were uh, okay with the changes as well. And town staff, which is for the board and the mayor to approve these fee updates. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay. Um, questions from the board. I'll start. We have not. Your memo states we have not updated these fees in over 10 years, therefore no fees will be increased. We're consolidating the fees. We're trying to make it better customer service for our residents and our developers and our contractors. So the statement that we have not updated our fee in 10 years weighs no bearing on this. Well, they haven't been consolidated either Okay. in 10 years. The. The consolidation is one example. Back on. The, in the packet, we had more examples. I just didn't want to list every single example in the memo, but in the packet and the fee update, it showed all the changes and redlined. Yeah, there was a lot of red lines with no explanations. It was very hard. It was very difficult to follow when you're scrolling down pages to go down to the red line changes and then go back up however many pages to find out what the fee was previously. Um, so there will be no fee increases. Can you explain to me how $75 is not an increase to $350? Because we're changing it from zero to 25 acres instead of less than one acre is 75. Um, then one to five is 125. We, this is for residential and commercial new builds. So a residential new build for whole development is quite large. So that's why we changed it to that. And for the smaller projects, uh, we changed it to one line, one, line, one line item instead of three because it was very low and we were asked to change it. We were, we sent it to the HBA and they approved with these changes. So talking about residential development, this in your example. Yes, the residential or commercial. Residential or commercial. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we're subsidizing the smaller developers for the larger developers for the fee increase. Yes. So now the guy developing one to five acres has to pay 350 where anything large was only a 
hundred dollar increase. Correct. So, so then, mathematically, the statement is wrong that there was no price increase because clearly you increased the prices of the fees for the smaller development. Well, I mean, if you have one acre. Previously, it was $75 to develop on, and now it's 350. That's a massive increase. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. And like I said, unless, is there common core well, math involved? Is, is, well, because <laughs> I'm not be following. Is there more examples of like that yeah. where? The consolidation caused the prices to the fee prices to go up. I don't have the old ones, the old fees in front of me. I just have the new, the new fees in front of me. To I, go I think I would that. like to see a comparison okay. of all the old fees and all the new fees in like a spreadsheet. So we could see if the prices actually did go up instead of. Not go up, Remain I can do that. <clears throat> We may have to, I, you know, speaking of comparison, like I mentioned, you mentioned that our fees haven't gone up in 10 years. So does that mean there's, there's no comparison here with other entities either? So does that mean our fee, we were overcharging for 10 years and now we're perfect or? No, we're actually undercharging compared to other municipalities. And where is that at? I did not We consulted that. with the HBA. So we met with the HBA. I think I reported back to you that um, the HBA was not happy with our initial change and we met with them. And so they did just like they did with Colorado Springs, just like they have with El Paso County. They did a review of this and compared, did a comparative analysis with other cities such as us, same size, um, and compared our fees. And I believe, Debbie, they submitted an email or a letter to you stating that they approved this process. Yeah. Because our fees are lower we spent than almost three percent. months working with them on this. So it's on it's yeah, page one thirty one, you have the letter from the HPA. Yeah, it just it just says we appreciate the call consolidation service and determination that current fees cover the cost. And that's what they do for many cities in El Paso County. Okay. Um, in the, in the fees. And I'll just bring it up ag again. Um, I know that. Me and you had discussed it offline, Mr. Foreman. Under Section E, construction permits. What page? I'm sorry. Oh, I got it right here. Never mind. Uh, it's 128 on my tablet. Yeah, I've got it. Right uh, or 10 in the corrected fees. Uh, variable fence permit review fee. Yes, sir. We're going to take that out. That that whole section right there, that whole paragraph is going to be taken out. And Debbie, you had a, a replacement for that. And for the residential fence permit, we're going to put an asterisk and say it does not apply to existing fences. Existing fences do not need to have a permit. It's only new fences with new builds would have to have a fence. Or if your property never had a fence, then you would need a fence permit. But if you're replacing your current fence, you do not need to a permit and that's our current regulations right now. But okay. we just want to let the residents know that within these fees with an asterisk stating that. Okay. Section F impact fees, use tax, dependent on type of permit, C section D. If you go to section D, it says nothing about any sort of use tax. unless I'm on the wrong section D. Maybe we can make a motion to let uh, the staff have this back and revise it and give us the information we need and vote on it in a, on a different meeting. 
when it's in its final form. I agree with that. Yes, I do too. Bye. So since it is a a resolution, we do need a motion. Is that correct, Mr. Ricci? Okay, that is correct. So if somebody would like to make a motion to that. I moved it to send this back to staff for review and to bring it back to us. I, I'd like to make a motion to table it until such time as the staff has it more prepared. Uh, Mr. Ricci, do both of those qualify? So I believe you should deal with the first motion um, and and determine if you have a second to that motion or and then address the next one, I think would be the proper procedural way to move forward. I, I'm not okay. going to argue. I'm not going to argue on the wording. So it's just a matter of procedure, Trustee Romanello. You had a motion. Do we have a second on that motion? And that motion was to send it back to staff and bring a uh, bring it with the changes discussed here tonight. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Hogan, will you take roll? Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee LaKind? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Yes. Trustee Unruh? Yes. So that motion passes 7-0. Does, does that automatically negate the second motion or does tr Trustee Clark need to withdraw that? She could either withdraw it or she could ask for you to reconsider and then Reconsider your passage and then add, pass hers instead. Trustee Clark, did you get that? I'll withdraw. Thank you. Okay. Uh, discussion items. Uh, Mr. Foreman, special events. Yes, uh, we last week decided to start taking applications for special events. Uh, we've received one so far, um, and we are awaiting guidelines from the governor's office on uh, how special events in the outside can be held. Uh, we hope to have that hopefully by April 16th and on the 19th board meeting update you on what we can do with special events at that time. Um, can you elaborate on the 16th? I don't know if everybody's up to date. So. Purportedly, the governor is going to have new guidelines that affect um, all kinds of uh, business openings, how many people you can have in offices, um, how many people can um, be in, in businesses, how many people can go to work and everything like that. But also, they're supposed to have guidelines on outdoor events updated by the 16th. And so we're going to present them to the board on the 19th. Okay. <laughs> I believe, and I might have just heard differently, that the governor is supposed to have that this week or next, and the county is supposed to release. He's supposed their to allow guidance. local control. Is what right. He's supposed to allow. And the county is supposed to relinquish the county control to us on the 16th. That's what but we hope. That's what we hope. I, okay. I'm not going to put words in anybody's mouth till it happens. And what is our one event? Um. Madeline just told me that uh, our newest special events program person is reviewing it right now. She didn't tell me which event it was. It's not the 4th of July. I don't think. Okay, the. So is the Memorial Day not considered a special event or how does that operate? Memorial Day is considered a special event. No, it is. It's a town event. It's a town event, but it's a town special. Event. Right, but the town doesn't. Submit special events. No, outside we don't. Entities. We don't have to have I permission. Can offer a little clarification on that. The way that our code is written, um, and it was specifically to exempt Memorial Day from the requirement of having to have a special event permit. Right. Um, because it's at the cemetery, uh, it doesn't trigger the need 
for the applicant to apply for a special event permit. We didn't want to put numbers on events um, at the cemetery because we didn't want to create a situation where if somebody were to have a large funeral, they would have to have a special event permit in order to do so. So we exempted um, the cemetery from that requirement. We all learned something new. Okay, so on that note, what is, um, is there any current discussion on the 4th of July? I know several board members have been asked consistently about it. As far as the town's concerned, we want to have it. Now, I think that the Chamber of Commerce is working on it right now. They are working with the Kiwanis Club, um, but they um, have not decided whether or not they're going to have the parade or not. And so I think that the chamber is considering having the beer garden and we're considering having music in the park and probably the downtown fair. And so if um, the, if the Kiwanis club decides to have the parade, there are going to be uh, special rules for parades submitted by the governor. It looks like we got some stuff today. And will he be down here to enforce them? I don't think so. Okay. To put in my 10 cents, I would love to see 4th of July happen. Excellent. Did you have something? Okay. Was there any other uh, comments for that discussion? Okay, Madeline just said, she just updated me. She said they did submit for 4th of July. So that is our one event. Madeline, does that include the parade? So the Kiwanis Club did submit their application for the parade. However, as an organization, they will not make a decision as to if they will if they will have it until May 1st. But they are going through the process of submitting their application so that they can begin planning. Can you please tell the Kiwanis thank you? <laughs> yes, I will. Was Um, this brings us to public comments. Is there anyone here that would like to make public comment? Uh, Mr. Anderson, is Ms. Swearinger still on? Okay, please do. Okay, Ms. Swearingen. It's been so long, I don't not sure I can remember. <laughs> See, we were talking about the the home rule thing, and that's a pretty significant change. I'm I am ambivalent either way um, right now, merely because um, I think that more information needs to be provided to the public. I don't know if it would be possible to get some of the government entities around us who have gone to home rule to possibly present the benefits that it is. Um, uh, brought to their communities um, to provide a little bit more clarification for everyone before we start getting into this and, and moving forward. I'm, I'm of a firm belief that on something like this, the more information provided, the better. And so it's just a, an option that I was wondering if might be possible. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Anderson, do we have anyone else wishing to make public comment? Okay. We will move on to board, board authorization items. Uh, Ms. Flynn. Yes, on May 3rd, Martin Landers with Plan Tools, who is our consultant for the code rewrite, would like to present a workshop with the planning commission and the board of trustees at one time. It will be a virtual presentation just to go over what we have completed thus far and what we have left. And we're almost to the finish line. Um, after this workshop that, that he'll present to you on May 12th, he'll be presenting the ordinance to the planning commission hearing. And then June 7th, we'll be presenting to the board as the last step to the process and he's has done a great job we're on our land use or zoning map right now and that's one of the last items so he's very excited to let you know our progress and what we have accomplished 
So you have May 3rd, which is a Monday. Are you talking about a joint evening meeting? Yes. Is the board in agreements with that? I can be there. It would be the first Monday in May. Yep. Yep. I'm good with that. We could do the meeting beforehand. Oh, 30 minutes at most. That would be preferable. So, yeah. So would this be how would this be announced? Uh Ms. Hogan, would this be a workshop or would it be a separate meeting? It would be um if it's to happen right before your regularly scheduled meeting, it would just be a line item on your agenda and it would read something like uh combined workshop of the board of trustees and planning commission and it would detail the time it starts and the topic okay so it sounded like that worked for all the board members correct works for me okay let's go ahead um is there any other board authorization items from anyone Seeing none, we'll move to Board of Trustee comments. Any comments from the board? I'd like to thank Nancy Swearingen and Laura Kronick for your consistent interest in the town and your very, um, uh, very um, important comments. Um, on that note, uh, Mr. Foreman, can you elaborate? I know you mentioned a survey piece. Can you elaborate on what the public plan is for home rule? I'll let Madeline cover that for us. She's in charge of that. Way to put her on the spot. She's ready. Um, so our plan right now is we have hired a consultant who will be sending public surveys out to our community and there will be three. One will be an overall general community survey. One will be about police services and one will be about home rule. Um, and those three should be happening within the next month to six weeks. And then we are also working to create some public education on some of these issues as well um, that will get out to the to the public via website and social media and some and some probably some town hall meetings of some sort. And is that on the same time frame? That we're that still follow? Through, we're still working through the details on that, but we're hoping that it will be a similar time frame, but would the education would extend quite a bit further than the surveys would. We'll use the data that we gather from the surveys to craft the education pieces. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to also reiterate what um, Mayor Pro Tem Elliott said. It is nice to have people in the gallery today, all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for social distancing. Um, are there any other Board of Trustee comments? Seeing none, I'll look for an adjourn a motion to adjourn. Shall we? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned.